Genesis. If you remember from previous chapters in Genesis, Abram and Lot split up. There was, they had too much cattle for the area they were in, and Lot chose the, the best property, the best watered land that he could see, and he did not um, take into account um, where that place actually was, and he ended up going and settling um, towards Sodom, and eventually he's living um, in Sodom, which of course we find out later in the Bible. Um, actually, we're finding out here because they're actually kind of um, being um, attacked and judged here by um, neighboring, um, neighboring kings. But Lot gets taken, uh, taken captive. by uh, the, this, this king comes up against the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, and they defeat these kings, and they end up taking, they steal everything from um, these places, and they end up taking Lot and his possessions captive. Of course, Abram hears about this um, in this chapter and just so happens that he has his own private army, basically. If you notice um, down in one of which verse was it, um, I always like that verse where it says, Abram um, armed his trained servants. So he didn't have to train his servants. He just gave them weapons. They already knew um, how to fight, these 300 and some men. And they went out and they rescued, they rescued Abram's nephew, all right? So they rescue Lot here. But look down at Genesis chapter 14 and look at verse number 16. So we're looking at um, Jesus. We're in the Jesus the sermon um, series, and we're going to look tonight at Jesus the high priest. So there's kind of an obscure um, event that happens after Abram rescues Lot here, and that's kind of what I want to point out, where Abram, he meets a man here in Genesis chapter number 14, and I want to show you tonight how many times uh, the New Testament sheds light on the Old Testament, whereas we would normally just read through this. I always like to look at that, where you read through this and say, okay, what information could I get out of this if I just had the Old Testament and I didn't have the New Testament? And hopefully you'll see that tonight, but look down at verse number 16. Let's look at this man um, who, G who uh, not Jesus, who um, Abram meets here. In verse number 16, um, so that's the context of the story. He, he took all the spoil. He won the battle. He's got all the spoil. And he brought back all the goods, and he brought, again, his brother, Lot, and his goods. So they're restoring all the, all the um, stolen spoil, as you would um, say, and the women also and the people. So it wasn't just Lot that was taken captive, but they had taken, um, they had robbed this land, these cities, and taken uh, women, children, and, you know, even men um, with Lot captive. Look at verse number 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So here we see um, this Melchizedek in uh, verse number 18, who is the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies, and blessed be, I'm sorry, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So now, even in verse number 20, it would be kind of difficult to understand, like, who gave who tithes there if you just read that verse. I mean, obviously, you can, just by reading the Old Testament, you're obviously going to realize that the priest is not going to give Abram the tithes, but um, Abram gives tithes to this king of Salem, or who is this priest of the Most High God, all right? So, obviously, Abram understands um, the significance, the, the person um, that he's dealing with here, but it can kind of be something that is a little bit obscure if this is all you're reading in the Bible. Now, flip over, and let's get the answer of who this individual is that Abram meets in verse number, uh, go over to Hebrews chapter 7, and let's start looking at verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter number 7. So the Bible explains to us in great detail in the book of Hebrews this idea of Jesus being the high priest and also who Melchizedek was. And it kind of gives us an explanation of why we have um, this situation going on in Genesis 14 and uh, at the end of Genesis 14 after Abram comes back from rescuing Lot. Look at verse number one of Hebrews chapter number seven to kind of decode this situation in Genesis chapter 14. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, obviously talking about 
the exact same person that we just read about in Genesis chapter 4, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. That's just what we read in Genesis 14, that Abram gave a tenth of this, these goods, the spoil, to um, the king of Salem. First being interpretation, now we start to get the answer and start to get clue after clue on who this was. And it's not going to take us too many clues as we see the titles of the king of Salem here. It says, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness. All right, I don't need any more clues after that one, but it gives us more. And it says also that, that also king of Salem. That matches up what he's called in Genesis chapter 14. And then it says, which is king of peace. And of course, Jesus, one of his other names is the prince of peace. Um, king of kings. And then look at verse number three. We really get the answer here. It says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like on your, you're like, I still don't get it. I'm like, who is it? You're like, I don't understand who it is. It says, but made like unto the son of God abideth a priest continually. So this is equating Jesus Christ with Melchizedek, the, the king of Salem that Abram met in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter number 14. And it is calling Jesus not only the high priest, but it's calling him the eternal high priest here. It's saying it's made like he is made unto this like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually, meaning he is different than the other priests. So that's um, Hebrews really just kind of goes into great detail on the different type of priest that Jesus is. But the point I'm trying to get you to see first is that Jesus was Melchizedek. Melchizedek was Jesus. So we have an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Abram met Jesus. All right. And look, that, see, that makes a lot of sense to me, it's that, it, that God would you know, present himself in that way to Abram, who was going to be the father of the nation that God brought into the promised land hundreds of years later. It makes a lot of sense that God would do this. But the point is, Jesus was Melchizedek, and Jesus was this great eternal high priest. All right? With, um, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Flip back a couple chapters in Hebrews chapter number 4. So I want to go into some detail tonight on the difference between the priesthood of Jesus Christ and the, the priesthood of the Levitical order or the Levitical priesthood. Look at Hebrews chapter number 4 and look at verse number 14. Now we could read all of Hebrews 4, all of Hebrews 7, all of Hebrews 5. We could read a lot of Bible on this, but I'm going to just try to get the point through to you in just a few verses here. Look at verse number 14 of Hebrews 4. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest. So that's what we're looking at tonight is the great high priest Jesus Christ, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That's our verse of the week. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So the Bible here is saying is that Jesus Christ, he was tempted like us, he felt he was 100% God, and he was 100% man. Now, that may be hard for you to wrap your head around because you're not God, but the Bible here is telling you that Jesus went through all the temptations, all the feelings, all the pain, all the suffering, all the, you know, the, the desires, as you would say, that men go through, except he did it without giving in to sin. Even the idea of a foolish thought, the Bible says. All right, look at verse number 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. This is the throne of this great high priest, this throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, that's an important verse because this is what Jesus, this high priest of this order that we're going to see Jesus is of, this is his throne. His throne is of grace so we can obtain mercy. Remember that word mercy because that's going to come up a little bit later. So Jesus is the great high priest. You say, what kind of high priest? Turn to Hebrews chapter number five. Is he a high priest like Aaron? Because Aaron was a high priest. All right. Aaron was a high priest of the Levitical priesthood, right? Look at verse number 10 of Hebrews chapter number. Five. So now I want to look at the difference between 
the high priesthood of Jesus and the high priesthood of you know, the Levitical priesthood. So we've got the order of Melchizedek, which was Jesus, and we've got the Levitical priesthood, which is, you know, Aaron was that first high priest. But there was many high priests um, of the Levitical priesthood. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, called of God and high priest after the older order of Melchizedek. That is Jesus, of course. So the question is, why do we need this new order? So it says here, the order of Melchizedek. Was something wrong with the first one? Was something missing with the first priesthood? Why have Jesus take on this role? Why even go here is what I want to get across tonight. I mean, why even go here as Jesus the high priest? Why not Jesus the savior of the world? Why even mess with the Levitical priesthood? And I want to show you that everything in the Old Testament was done as a picture of things to come in the New Testament, and it was all fulfilled through Jesus Christ, including what? Including the Levitical priesthood. All right? Look at verse number, go back over to Hebrews chapter 7 and look at verse number 11. So, was something wrong? The question is, was something wrong with the Levitical priesthood? And the answer is, yes. There was something that was missing from it. There was something that was left to be desired from it. And the Bible tells us in verse number 11 of Hebrews chapter 7. The Bible says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. Now, if you want to say, um, if you want to just match like wording, you can just say the Levitical priesthood is the old order, is the order of the old priests. And now we're going to hear Hebrews talk about the order of Melchizedek. It's a change in order. Kind of like, I don't know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's exactly the same thing. Look at uh, verse number 11. For if, per, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, and then in parentheses we see, for under it the people received the law. So here we see a purpose of the Levitical priesthood, which was to deliver the law to the people. What does that mean? Well, it's just what I'm doing to you now. I'm delivering the law to you. I'm delivering you the word of God. I'm delivering you the Bible. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? This is the question we're looking for here. And not be called after the order of Aaron. Why the change is what the Bible asks us. Look at verse number 12. For, and this is, I love that word for in the Bible because it's saying, here's why. It's basically answering the question that it just um, asked in verse number 11. It said, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. We'll get to that in a minute. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gaveth attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He's just here, he's saying, Jesus wasn't of uh, the tribe of Levi. He wasn't, he wouldn't even have qualified as a Levitical priest. It's saying, no, 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 he came from the tribe of Judah. You know, that's why it's called the Lion of Judah. All right? For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So you're like, all right, this is something different. And yet it is far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Again, that Melchizedek order, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Again, showing that Jesus is the priest. Right? For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So go to verse number 23, if you would, of Hebrews chapter number 7. So here it's just saying that perfection, if perfection, in verse number 11 it says, if perfection was achieved by the Levitical order of priests, there would not be a need for another priest. Okay? If perfection could be achieved that way. But perfection cannot be achieved that way. All right? So that's the first thing. But there's also another uh, reason that you know, there needed to be another um, eternal priest. Look at verse number 23. I, I love this, this verse. It's just so practical. It says, And they truly were many priests, talking about the Levitical priesthood of Aaron, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. I got news for you. Now, I'm not going to be the eternal pastor of this church because I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to be dead one day. You're like, that's depressing. But look, you're all going to be dead one day physically. All right. But this man, he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. So that's a huge difference right there. And that's why there was priest after priest after priest after priest because they simply died. They were not eternal. They were not everlasting. This priesthood of Jesus, of the order of Melchizedek, is going to be forever. There will never be a change 
in the priesthood that exists right now with the order of Melchizedek. But really the main reason for Jesus was not only just, well, it's really two reasons. Number one, he takes the priesthood into eternity. That's number one. And number two, the Levitical priesthood could not perfect you. Look at verse, I mean, again, in verse number 11, if you just want to look, if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, what further need? That is a very powerful verse right there. It is saying that the priesthood of Aaron that delivered the Bible could not perfect you. I got, look, let's just put that right on me. Let's just put that on the pastor of a church today who delivers the law to you that pastor delivering that law cannot perfect you. You cannot be perfected that way. Turn to Romans chapter number 7. So look, the priesthood of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, was there, the Bible says, to deliver the law. And there was a problem with that because delivering the law to you, and I want you to remember how many times you hear this word perfect and righteous and holy come up as we're talking about um, this topic tonight. Because it's super important that you understand that perfection, that righteous, that holy, they all, they all identify a specific standard, one standard, okay? And the Levitical priesthood could not perfect you even through God's word as it delivered God's word to you. Well, what is God's word? Look at Romans chapter 7. And look at verse number one. And that begs the question, God, what is called the law. And the law is sitting in front of you. It's sitting on your lap. The law is the Bible that's given to you. And the law, if the priesthood delivering the law to you cannot perfect you, you know what that means? It means the law cannot perfect you. Look down at Romans chapter number seven and look at verse number one. Romans chapter seven, this is what Paul explains in verse number 1 of Romans chapter number 7, it says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So you're saying, okay, uh, what's, what's the purpose of this law? That's what these next few verses, this entire chapter is talking about, is what is the purpose of the Bible? What is the purpose of, you know, the Ten Commandments and just the entire Word of God that is sitting in front of you. What is the purpose of that? And why couldn't those priests of Aaron delivering that perfect word of God, what, what did that do for me? Is what I want to answer for you tonight. Now we get this great little analogy in the next two verses. All right, And this is a, such a great analogy. And of course it is because God wrote it. But look at verse number two. It says, for the woman, this is just an analogy. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. This is saying, this is saying that a woman who is married, she's not loosed from the law of her husband just because she doesn't want to be married anymore. You know, this goes against the teaching of just everything today. But it's saying, you know, God hates divorce. The only way she would be loosed from that law where she could actually go and marry someone else is if her husband died, if she became a widow. It says, so then... If while her husband liveth, he's alive, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. She's breaking the law at that point. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. It's a pretty simple scenario here, right? Like, the only way that a wife, or you know, even a husband, God, Jesus tells it both ways, could be free from his marriage is if her husband dies. Look, you can't kill the person. Obviously, that's murder. But I mean, just like someone dies, the spouse dies, then you're free from the law, okay? Other than that, you're in adultery. And Jesus taught exactly the same thing, but this is a great analogy. It says, wherefore, and it's, what it means by that is in the same way of being free from this law, my brethren, you're also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So this law right here, the Bible is saying, you become free from it, dead to it, meaning it can't, it can't get you, it has no power over you, through the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we, and I always have this word underlined in the book of Romans, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. 
All right? It doesn't say that you will for sure bring forth fruit unto God. A lot of people misunderstand that. These are the people that, te that teach, oh, once you're saved, you know, through Christ, like, you're just going to, you will have fruit. You will do the works. I mean, no, it's like you should do the works. You should follow what God wants you to do. And that's why you see this word come up again and again, should, should, should. That's why you have to have a King James Bible in front of you, because these tiny little words change doctrine. These tiny little words mean everything. But what the Bible is saying first, before I even get to that word, is that we are free from the law. The law has no more power over us. Just as, you know, a woman whose husband dies, that law does not apply. She is free from that law and can marry another. And the Bible is saying, the way the Bible, we are free from the law and its, its power over us, and I'm going to tell you what that power is, is through Christ. That's the only way. Being married to another, meaning we're married to Christ. All right, we're married to um, the Son of God. Meaning it is His righteousness, His everlasting priesthood, that you know, gets us free from this law. Look at verse number 5. We're free from it through Christ. That's the main part, right? Look at verse number 5. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What this is saying is that when you were in the flesh, before Christ was in your life, before you trusted in Jesus, it's saying the law, it, it worked fruit in you, and through your sin, it killed you. It, it put death upon you. Look at verse number 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we, again, here's that word again, we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the latter. Now, this is a really deep verse right here in verse number 6. But if you've ever noticed, just look at the last part of this verse. It says, okay, so again, we're delivered from the law through Christ. That being dead wherein we were held, we were dead in the law. The law, before, before Jesus, the law killed you. That's what the Bible is saying. And then only through Jesus, only through Christ, you are free from the law wherein ye were held. You're, it's like you've been broken out of prison. The law no more, longer has this power of death over you. But look at the last part of this verse. It says that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of of the letter. Now, here's what's super interesting. If you've ever wondered, I mean, just raise your hand if you've ever wondered why people that believe in works-based righteousness many times are not doing any of the works that they believe would get them to heaven. Have you ever noticed that? Like, just someone who is someone, I mean, and how many times have you been told at the door that you can't tell people that? You can't tell people that it's not of works. You can't tell people that they can go, that they can just trust on Jesus and then do whatever they want because people will just go crazy. How many times have you heard people tell you that? But what actually happens a lot of the time? People that truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, not every time. The Bible's saying you should do these things. You should. You still have free will to choose the flesh or the spirit. But the Bible's saying... That you should serve in newness of spirit, meaning that you should serve that Holy Spirit that is in you and not in the oldness of the letter. And the reason is, is because you have much more loyalty to the Holy Spirit that is in you and guiding you once you're saved than someone who's just like being told what to do and told like, you know, I'm just going to beat you over the head with the Bible and you're not saved and just go and do works to get yourself to heaven. That's why you see so many people that, I mean, it's almost a trend. The more somebody believes in being a good person to get to heaven, like many times the worst type of person they are. I mean, you would think, just like from our human logic, that if somebody was trying to get to heaven through their works, that they would at least be trying to do good works and not be out just being like everything else in the world and everyone else in the world out there. But that's why you see, I mean... You know, that's why you see Bible-believing Baptists that actually believe the Bible have trusted in Jesus. You see so many of them trying to live, trying to live for that spirit that is in them, right? Even though it's not about their salvation. They're just trying to serve in newness of spirit that God has given them. 
out of their own free will to serve the Lord that saved them. Right? It's kind of like carrot versus stick. Right? The carrot, you know, seems to work much better. God gave us this free gift, and we should want to serve him. And that's to all saved people out there, just the other side of this coin is, saved people out there that are doing nothing for the Lord, like, what's wrong with you? Like, why would you not? I mean, you know you're saved if you're saved. Why would you not want to do the will of the God that saved you? Why would you not show your love towards God that gave you eternal life when you deserve nothing but hell? Look at verse number seven. Again, explaining what the law is. I don't want to rabbit trail this too much, but what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. The Bible is saying that the only way you would know what you were doing wrong, that's a per one of the purposes of the law, is to show you your sin. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concu concupiscence. I can always have a hard time with that word. Meaning, you know, just sin and just lust and desire. For without the law, sin was dead. Basically what he's saying in those two verses is the law just pops out sin to you. The law is like a, a magnifying glass to your sin. And then verse number 9 is a great verse for, um, you know, children that, that have died young, or even, like, this is a very great verse for, you know, children that were murdered in the, in the womb. The Bible here is showing, you say, where in the Bible does it say that all children go to heaven? Well, this verse right here. It says, for I was alive without the law once. This is Paul speaking here through the Holy Spirit. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. When was Paul alive without the law? When in Paul's life was he alive without the law? And the answer is when he was a small child. He was alive without the law. Small children do not understand the, the Bible. They do not understand sin. They do not understand, you know, that, that, that they should be following the Word of God. You know, once they grow up, then, you know, the law enters, and sin revives, and they die, and they need to be saved. All right, look at verse number 10. In the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Oh, that's confusing. The Bible here is saying is that the commandment is trying to push you into life. But Paul, when he first, he was a child, and then he grew up, and he understood the law. He understood the Bible. He's reading the Bible. He's reading the Word of God. He's understanding, and he's like, oh, man, I'm a sinner. And he's saying it's ordained, meaning the purpose of this book is so I may have life, but I found it to be death. But you have to find death before you can find life, is the answer to this, this verse. You have to understand that you are a sinner and you deserve death. And that is the purpose of the law, Paul is explaining. And then it will drive you to the only way you could possibly find life. Look at verse number 11. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. It's saying sin, it's just my flesh just wants to sin anyway, uh, regardless of what the commandment says, and by it slew me. So it's the sin that slays us, wherefore the law is, here's these words again. Here's this word. What's that word that we looked at? We looked at perfect already. That the Levitical priesthood could not perfect you. It could not make you perfect. Wherefore the law, another, another uh, uh, synonym for perfect is holy. Where the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. All right? So the Bible is perfect. It is holy. It is something that a priest reading you this Bible, this Bible's perfect, but I can't read this Bible to you and make you perfect. That is the problem. All right? That is the problem. All right? So look, the law simply shows us our sin. It shows us that we deserve death. And without Christ, that sin will kill you. And it will kill you eternally. That's that second death that the Bible is talking about. So the law shows us, again, the law shows us the perfect standard of God. That's what the law shows us. And look, no man can meet that standard. No man and most 99.9% .9 of people will admit this to you, that they cannot meet that perfect standard of holy perfection righteousness. And what does that do? That drives us to Christ. 
that drives us to that eternal priesthood. Let's go back to that priest. So he is there. The priest is there to show his people the Bible. So I'm here to show you the Bible. If you want to just apply that to the modern day church, the local church, I guess the question is, since the Bible is perfect, we had this other priesthood come in, and I, I mean, I've already kind of said this already, but the point is, the Levitical priesthood was to drive the people to the Bible. And the question becomes, what else was needed? And we know what was needed because Romans 7 already told us, but here's the thing, if you believe in works-based righteousness, nothing else is needed. If you believe in works-based righteousness, meaning you believe that if you're sitting, and none of you are sitting here thinking this, but let's just have a little thought experiment. Let's have a thought experiment that I get up here and I preach the Bible to you, and I preach the whole Bible to you, and I'm very thorough, and I don't miss anything. And you're the type of person, you're just like, I'm going to do everything in that Bible, and I'm never going to skip a beat. We all know that this can't be done, and most people will admit this. But the point is, if you could perfectly execute the Bible in your life, nothing else would be needed. All you would need is the law. That's it. Because the law is perfect. And if you can perfectly emulate the law, you would be perfect. So nothing else would be needed. But the problem is that there's none righteous. No one can do that. That's why the Levitical priesthood failed. That's why they could not perfect people. Because all men are sinners. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse number 19. Hebrews chapter number 7, verse number 19. So I already read for you that the Levitical priest could not make you perfect. It could not perfect you. But look at verse 19. We get even a more detailed statement. It says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better... Look at this. So again, just look at that first verse there, the first half of that verse. The law cannot make you perfect. And the, per the perfection, righteousness... Holiness, that is the only standard that is in the Bible. The law can't make you perfect, but it can drive you towards something. But the bringing in of a better what? A better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So look, it drives you to a point where you're like, I can't do this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm dead I'm dead man walking. The wrath of God is upon me. The law can tell me that, can it? Can't the law tell me that I can't be perfect and that because I can't be perfect that the wrath of God abideth on me? Can't the law tell me that? And what does that do? That drives me nigh. What does that mean? It drives me closer to God. I go to God and I say, God, I, I, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. Well, God, thank God that he's like, I got a different priesthood for you then. I've changed the priesthood, and you can now have that hope. The law just kills you. But you need to understand that the law kills you. Good thing it has the hope in there in that verse. Good thing it's there. In hope of eternal life. Good thing we can have that hope. You see how you can't really have the Old Testament without the New? You see how it all kind of just fits together? One literally completes the other. This is why we need a new high priest and one that is forever. Turn to Romans chapter number 3. One that is forever and one that does perfect us. Because look, when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven and you stand before, you know, Jesus Christ, you better, I mean, God better see perfection there. Because there will be nothing that goes into heaven that is not perfection. He had better see perfection. But there's a way for him to see perfection. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse number 21. A couple verses. I always, you always like to read a couple verses before and after the soul winning verses that we just repeat hundreds of times just to kind of get the context refreshed with us. Look at verse number 21. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness... How many times... Look at this phrase. Righteousness of God. Even the righteousness of God which is by, you can have the righteousness of God. That's what the Bible is saying, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. The Bible is saying is that that's how you get the righteousness of God. That, there's your hope right there. It's not your righteousness. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus, 
the eternal high priest that saves you. It is that priesthood that offers you that hope through faith in Jesus Christ that saves you. There is no other way. Now, here's what's interesting about this Jesus high priest. I want to show you one story in the Bible, and then I want to kind of wrap this up to people that believe in a works-based righteousness. I want to just kind of take a, a logical path um, in just a few minutes. But it's interesting because Jesus tried to tell people he was a high priest, and nobody understood him. Turn to Matthew chapter number 12. He tried to explain this, and just like everything else, or many other things that Jesus said, you know, almost no one understood what he was talking about. Look at Matthew chapter number 12, and we see this cool story um, in the Bible where Jesus is basically telling these people that I am the high priest, all right? That I am the most important high priest that has ever um, walked into the temple. Look at verse number uh, 1 of Matthew chapter number 12. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But the Pharisees, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and that they were with him? This is when he was fleeing from Saul with his men. How he entered into the house of God. So who was David? He was the king, right? That's interesting. How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread which is not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. So he's saying, I mean, there's a little king section in there too. He's like, well, you're okay when the king did it. Why aren't you okay when I did it? I'm the king of kings. And then he's saying, but that bread was for who? Basically he's saying to eat on the Sabbath was only for who? He's like, the priests. And look what he says next. Or have you not read in the law? How that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the sab Sabbath and are blameless. He's saying, the priests can do it. Why can't I? <laughs> but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Then he like skips like three levels. And he's just like, I'm not even greater than the priests. I'm greater than the entire temple. Because I'm what? I'm a new priest of the order of Melchizedek, the eternal great high priest. This is what he's telling them right over their head. Look at verse number 7. But if he had known what this meant, and now look at this. I told you to remember that word. If you know what this meaneth, which they didn't, he says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What did the Levitical priests do? I mean, yeah, a bunch of tax collectors and fishermen wrote the Bible. Give me a break. What did Jesus, what did Jesus tell people that he says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What did the Levitical priests do? They, they did all these sacrifices constantly for all these different things that were just pictures of what? And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not that kind of priest. He's like, I will have mercy. You know what that means? He's like, I deliver hope. I am a priest that delivers mercy. And he says, if you would have known this, that I'm a new order of priest that instead delivers mercy to sinners, mercy to people that could never be holy, mercy to people that could never be perfect, mercy to people that could never be righteous. Through what? Through faith in me, is what he's saying. He's saying, that's the kind of, he's like, that's what I deliver. That's my priesthood. Don't you think people should have asked more questions to Jesus? Like, what do you mean by that? Could you explain that a little bit more? Instead, they're just, ah, get out of here with that stuff. He's literally explaining what Paul is explaining to us in Hebrews chapter 4, 5, and 7. He's explaining the kind of priesthood that he is. He's, he says to them in Matthew 12, the new high priest is here because the old priest could not perfect you. The new one is here. Bringing hope through his righteousness, bringing mercy through his righteousness instead of death that the law shows you you deserve. Which is all the law can bring is death. Now look, I don't speak, I know everyone here is saved, and I don't speak to the online, you know, YouTube audience much, but I know that we do have some people, I get some emails from time to time on doctrine and questions and things like that. I know that we do have some listeners that do believe in workspace righteousness in one degree or the other. They either believe you can lose your salvation 
or they believe, you know, they just like the Bible preaching, maybe they like the Bible studies, whatever it is. But let me just, let me just say this to those people. Think this through for just a couple of minutes. Think this workspace righteousness thing through for just a couple of minutes. Look, and this is an inconsistency that we see all the time. People believe in workspace salvation. Whether they tell you, well, you can't, no, you could lose your salvation. Yep, it's faith in Jesus, but you also have to follow the Bible or, you know, you're not going to be saved or God's going to take away your salvation or whatever. Here's the point. Here's the point that I want people to follow through just thinking this for a second. There is only one standard in the Bible, and that standard is perfection. And if you follow people through on their thought process, every single person that believes, every single person that I've ever met that believes in workspace righteousness will admit to you freely that they can't be perfect, that they can't be holy, that they can't be righteous. Every single, the vast majority of people that I have talked to that believe in workspace righteousness, you can lose your salvation, you have to do the works, lordship salvation, repent of your sins. Workspace salvation and all the sins, all the people that believe that will freely admit to you that they cannot achieve perfection. And to those people, I would say, think about this for a second, because there is only one standard in the Bible, and that standard is perfection. Otherwise, you would have to freely admit to me that you could never really know if you're good enough. Because whatever this medium standard is that will get you to heaven through your works, or through your 20% works, 40% works, 5% works, whatever you think it is, whatever that standard is, is not in the Bible. The only standard in the Bible is complete holiness. That's it. Again and again. Holy, righteous, perfect. The Levitical, the law could not perfect you. The Levitical priest could not perfect you. It's the only standard. There is no middle standard. So then you would have to logically admit that you could never know whether you're saved or not. And many people do believe this. Turn to 1 John chapter 5 and we'll end here. Many people do believe, I just got asked this a week and a half ago. You can't know. How could you know? And look, I get it. I understand completely if you believe in works-based salvation and you understand that the only standard in the Bible is holiness. I hope I'm making this simple. The only standard God lists in the Bible is holiness. There is no other like B, B minus, C, C plus. There's nothing like that. It's holiness or nothing. And we're driven, we're shown our sin, we're shown our, our deserving of death through the law, and the only way we can be, because we have to be righteous, folks. When you stand in front of God, you have to be righteous, and the only way we can have it is righteousness through Christ. That's it. There's no other standard. So if you believe, that, well, maybe God just didn't tell us. Maybe there is an arbitrary standard, and God will just have to decide. I've heard that so many times, too. I'm sure you have as well. That, well, when I go and I stand in front of God, he's just going to have to decide at that point. Did I meet that bar that he didn't tell me about? Did, he, did I meet that arbitrary standard that he didn't list to us? Which, it's possible that God could have done it that way. I don't know why he would have done it that way. That doesn't seem just to me. Guess what? He didn't do it that way because he tells us that you can know if you're going to heaven. Right. Look at verse number 13 of 1 John chapter number 5. The Bible says, now this is what you call a believe on sandwich right here. It says, I have... These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know. Look, ye, is, he's talking to the people, okay? That ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's like a, that's like a trust Jesus sandwich right there with, uh, you can know you're saved in the middle as the filling. Believe on Jesus, you can know if you believe on Jesus. Like, he doesn't want there to be any kind of, like, misunderstanding of that verse. But here's the answer, folks, to all these people that think that it's arbitrary. You can't Look, the Bible literally says you can know. And the only way you can know, because there is no other standard in the Bible, the standard is perfection. It is holiness. We all fall short of that. 
everyone. And everyone will admit that. So to the person that's hanging on to their works even a little bit, you admit that you can't be perfect. You admit that you can't be holy. The only way out of that is to believe on, meaning completely let go of your works and trust completely on Jesus Christ, the great high priest. Because that is what he brings. He brings that mercy. He brings that mercy. So if you just think about the standard, the only standard that is listed in the Bible, you can see why Jesus has to be this new order of priesthood. He has to be this eternal high priest because he, and through him, is the only way that we can be perfected. And the law is simply to drive us straight. Our heads and have a word of prayer.